We left off with a question. Say it again, please. We left off with a question. We left off with a question. One <laughs> member of our group had, uh, had a question. Ah, okay. What was the question? And um, she was concerned about if, if any of us had, had uh, experienced a stickiness of joints. And, and we were trying to define what stickiness was. So, um, so, so you have a sensation as you're moving of the, your joints being sticky? Well, it's not, it's not necessarily the joint, it's the, it's the tissues, uh, like the, the soft tissues around the joints that feel uh, adhesive. Like there is an adhesion in the, and of course it limits it's li, it limits the range of motion and it's sometimes it's painful. Yes, it's. Do, do other people experience that that sense of of sticky um, adhesion, like things not getting in the way? Is that? Okay. A different things. Um, so Sometimes I can actually take that, that question and hold it till the end of class today, because I think today's class will um, explain a little bit what causes that feeling of adhesion in the in the soft tissue, and give you some ideas of skeletal ways to. Um, to feel more fluid in there. I, I would love to hear what you talked about in your small groups, because I think it's good for everybody to hear each other talk about how you're using what you're learning in here in your life. Because it's great to feel better after the hour, but if it doesn't translate into what you're doing outside, you're missing the the real juice in this work and so yeah scott we said we got a lot more of this when we're walking up the street uh-huh what so more more arm movement more <laughs> shoulder more more sort of power and force as you're going forward well, and, and thinking about it, the fact Thanks. that normally you wouldn't walk that way, but now that you're thinking about it, you can force yourself to walk that way. Uh-huh. So you have some, some ideas of things that you can experiment with when you're walking that make you feel different. Yeah. Rich. Well, I had felt that uh, I uh, felt better after the program was, was done, you know, that forced me to uh, go through it, so to speak. And uh, that's beneficial just to keep you, get you in the pattern of doing the exercise. So the, the knowing that uh, I can feel better, <laughs> Um, if I if I do this, is is just that is pretty major in terms of sense of optimism, um, of coping with things. Um, do you find that right after class you're you're doing some different things in your life, like you know moving more or or doing things differently? Well, if I'm trying to look out the window behind me, for example, I know that. It's turned the whole body instead of just looking over your shoulder. And uh, so when we practiced that, then we achieved better results. You, know? uh -huh. you could kind of do it again. So just it sounds like there's a, a little voice in your head that, that says, use your whole body, Rich. Um, and, and, yeah. Yeah. It's not a very profound thing, but if you can apply it. Uh, it does help. To use everything you've got to do what you want to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Any, anyone else? Yeah, I can, I'd like to report that uh, I take the dance for Parkinson's class three days a week. And this class complements what we do in that dance for Parkinson's exercise class. It gives some meaning to the different moves that we do in, in the dance for Parkinson's. So yeah, the, the Dance for Parkinson's class is um, inviting your body to, to move in new ways as well. And in, in this class, it kind of slows it down and you can see, oh, that's what I'm trying to do in that class. And you go, oh yeah, if I lift my hip, that'll work easier. Or, you know, where's my foot? It gives you the ability to find your way into new moves that you might otherwise find challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else doing Dance for Parkinson's? Yeah, we are. Well, do, you have, do you have something to say there? I could never dance before. It's never too late to learn how to dance. <laughs> Disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I could sing and dance, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> There's a really big difference in dancing for the pleasure in your body versus dancing for performing or, or, or for what it looks like. And the, the dance for Parkinson's um, movement, just like the movement in here, is more about looking for pleasure in movement um, rather than, than anything else. Yeah. Other folks, are there times of day? Uh, Elizabeth. Um, I have been having trouble with one shoulder and uh, I've been in the class and hadn't made much progress and I realized in the last few days that I'm moving much more easily and comfortably and my range of motion and both shoulders are moving much better um, and uh, I'm paying more attention. I think the last three or four classes have had uh, things with the shoulders and the hands which have been really helpful. So. Um when you say you're paying more attention, um, what do you pay attention to that seems to help? Uh, stopping movement when I have pain. Okay. Not pushing through as much and slowing down. And, uh, and when I do the physical therapy uh, exercise, I've been uh, do, watching in the mirror and uh, thinking about how it was moving and and connecting the two between what I was doing and what I could visualize and, you know, how it felt. Yeah, that there's a lot of with that you're applying your awareness that you're learning by slowing it down in here into the day and just the not pushing through pain and trying to find an alternative path to do the movement. That's major because then you stop irritating the joint and then the inflammation gets a chance to heal and it gets to find its full range of motion. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Are there times of day that you find yourself like, or certain activities um, that, that, kind of trigger a, a, a Feldenkrais thought. Um, a how do I use myself thought? <coughs> when I'm walking, I find myself out of sync and I stop and I think about it and then continue again. It helps. Think about what I'm supposed to be doing or what, and what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. The, being able to sense when you're out gives your brain a chance to find an alternative. But if you don't stop and notice things are cattywampus right now, you don't even think to try it differently. And having the sensations of what smooth and easier movement feels like gives your brain just something to look for again. And then the, the cues that we do in the class to, to help. Um, yeah. I work in an office all day. Um, my husband and I own a business and I have to sit at a desk sometimes all day and it's 
very difficult because you start getting stiff. And so I have to think of new ways to move while mm -hmm. I'm sitting there or get up and move around and then sit down again. And that's uh, challenging. Uh huh. But just the, the noticing that you get stiff and the noticing that, oh, if I get up and move around or do something different, I feel better. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I love Feldenkrais's book called The Elusive Obvious because when you say it, it sounds mundane, like, of course, but to actually do it in the moment um, is, makes a profound difference in your, in your comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, oh, anybody have anything else or also I'm going to start in the lesson. Uh, Barbara, uh, unmute yourself, Barbara. Okay. Um, one of the several ways I do carry it through the day is, is when I'm feeling pain or if and I can just think of it, like if I'm doing dishes in terms of just to find uh, an, another location in my body to move from and explore that and include, include it in the gesture. And uh, so in a general way, using that, as, if you can, if I can pause and do that. The thought comes first, and then if I can pause myself to apply it as slowly as I can, or as long as I can, it's always beneficial. Yeah, that's, that's a great one. It's a general principle is that we have habits for where we start our movement. And breaking up that habit by trying something different is often a way to find a, a way that, that doesn't hurt. And especially if you find a way to start it from the big body parts and go out to the periphery rather than starting it with the hand and going up or that, that big muscles for big movement makes a big difference. It is a whole new orientation to think of, of those, of the body as, as my bones. <clears throat> so yes. that's, that's uh -huh. a big change. And, and that does kind of get you to resonate with the pelvis or the bigger areas too. So today, today we're going to play with that concept um, with, with the thinking of the body as bones um, significantly. We're going to, I have my virtual pool, pool cue, and we're going to play with that in our, in our bodies today. Um, but the thinking of it as bones helps you think of how the force goes through your body. And there is a biomechanical aspect of, of how we move. Our bones have to hold us up. Our muscles have to move those bones. And the alignment of the bones just makes a big difference in terms of comfort. So come to the front of your chair. And just notice how tall you feel today. If you were, if you had a virtual doctor's office thingy that goes on the top of your head that you're, 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 you're sitting at, just get a sense of how, how tall you are. And are you a little taller on your right side or a little taller on your left side? It's a strange thought, but if you look at any person in this window in, in our Zoom class, you can see that one side of their head is a little higher than the, the other side. See if you can sense it in yourself, which, which side is your tall side. Um, and then imagine a line going down from your nose. So whether it's like a, a string with a weight on it, like a plumber's bob, or I was having fun looking for props this morning. If I, if I have a, a some kind of household cleaning implement from where my nose is and it goes down to the floor. Um, where does it hit the floor? Mm. Does it, is it a little bit to the left of your middle or to the right of your middle? Does it hit the floor or does it land somewhere on your body? Mm. Sort of how far in the forward back line is it? Okay. And then do the same thing with your chin. Imagine a string down to a weight on the ground. Does that land in the same place as the nose one? Usually it doesn't. Usually it, it's a little over to one side than the other. I 
another way to, to do this is just to imagine, is your nose right over your chin or is your chin over to one side a little bit? And just check, open your eyes and look at your little Zoom box of yourself. You might have to go to gallery view in order to see yourself if you're in speaker view. And look and, and see when you look at yourself, like I always like to hold my head this way. So my chin's always over there and my nose is always over there a little bit. And just notice what your pattern is for, for what you're doing. And then which is further forward, your chin or your forehead? You can kind of play with, you know, pulling your chin in, pushing your chin out. Let's see if you have a default of, you always hold your head forehead forward or chin forward. I shouldn't say always, because it's really just at this moment. These things do change over time and as we move. Okay, now um, put one finger right on your belly button, on your navel, and as you drop a line from there to the floor, notice does that land in the middle or does it land to one side? And notice if you have an immediate urge as soon as you feel any asymmetry to correct it and try and let that go for the moment, just let it, let it land where it lands. Okay. Then imagine that a friend was walking into your room. Would it be easier to give them a hug on the right or to give them a hug on the left? Which way feels like it's kind of downhill and which way feels a little more uphill? I'm just gonna mute everybody so we have a little less background. Um, and then begin to pay attention to your feet and your left foot. Do you have more weight out toward the fourth toe line or toward the big toe line on your left foot? And more weight in your heel or in your forefoot? And on your right foot, do you have more weight on the big toe line or out toward the fourth or somewhere in the middle? And then your shoulders, notice if you dropped a line from one shoulder to the floor or the other shoulder to the floor, is one a little bit more forward of the other one? And you may be seeing a pattern in what, where the weight is in your feet, which shoulder is forward a little bit and where your plumb line drops. They're often all connected. And then one more just measurement thing, which is to take a breath in. And as you take a breath in, does it go up one side of your neck more than the other? Like if you try to breathe to get taller, does one side of you get taller more than the other? And it's usually just little differences that you're looking for. All right. So now we're gonna start playing and then we'll see where it, where it goes. Um, reach under and find one sit bone. Get your, your hand can go down your back pocket and underneath you. You feel the shape of that sit bone, how wide it is today, where the front surface is, where the back surface is. You can lift it up off the chair a little bit so you're not mashing your fingers too hard, but you could still feel the bone. And just wiggle around that, that sit bone a little bit. And then take your hand out. And as you take your hand out, go back at a little 45 degree angle just so that you're encouraging your sit bone to go back and out a little bit. And then do the other sit bone. Next. And 
and feel the front and the back, the width. Remembering you can lift your bottom a little bit so that you're not hurting your hand. And then when you take your hand out, go back at 45 degrees a little bit. And see if you found that little bit to the front surface of the sit bone that we've explored in other classes. And then drop the plumb bob from your nose and see if it's landing a little closer to the middle. Sometimes just this little bit of finding the sit bones helps restore the body sense of, of symmetry. So Danielle, when you're at the office, if you're looking for just a quick, refreshing, quick thing, reach in, pull your sit bones back, find them. And just see now, like, is it easier? What happens when you breathe? Is it easier to breathe? up into the back of your neck and to make your head longer. Now, experiment for a moment. Take one foot and roll it onto the big toe, the big toe side, and see which side of your body gets shorter. You could experiment by rolling it back out to under the fourth, and then to the big toe and see if one of those makes you taller and one of those makes you shorter. And then try it on the other foot, roll into the big toe and then roll your foot outward a little. And if you roll your foot all the way out to the fifth toe, you probably get shorter again. There's a spot right around the fourth, which is usually the, the one where we feel the, the tallest. Okay. So now that you're sitting, um, tilt your head a little bit one way. And where do you bend? When you tilt it this way, which vertebrae of your 24 takes most of the bend? Most of us, when we bend our heads, it's kind of an L shape that we make with our spine and, and, and one particular spot, okay? And then bend your head the other way and feel which vertebrae does most of the work. It's often radically different. When you go one way, it's often something in your neck that bends. And when you go the other way, it's often something in the chest that bends. For some of us, I mean, it, you know, everybody's different in the way we've organized ourselves, but just feel your, your differences left and right. Anybody who's feeling a difference in where they bend? So now if you imagine your spine as a continuous curve, if you want to bend in a different place, you have to from the inside put pressure in a different place. Like if I want to bend in the middle of the curve, I put the pressure at 90 degrees to that spot. But if I want to bend up in the neck, I have to aim at a little angle. Or if I want to bend low down in the spine, I have to aim at a little lower angle to the circle. So I want you to imagine that you have your own gentle stick. It could have a nice rubber ball on it. And you, if you want to bend here, you push a little bit up that way. If you want to bend here, it's kind of a straight push. If you want to bend in your lower spine, you push down a little. And on, go up and down one side, inviting different vertebrae to do the bend. And you may find you have to shift your weight a little bit in order to do this. If you don't shift your weight, like try and keep yourself really still in the middle, and then nothing wants to bend. But if you move yourself over onto one sit bone, you'll find that suddenly all the vertebrae get a little easier to move. 
So if I'm wanting to shorten my right side, I put my weight on my left sit bone. Pause for a moment. Let's do that again, but this time notice what your foot is doing to help you do this. So if I'm bending my right side, paying attention to the right foot, is it easier to aim for different vertebrae if your foot's on the big toe side or if it's under the weights under the fourth toe side? And whichever side you're bending, what happens if you tip your head the other way? What's it like to bend the vertebrae opposite the head? Or if you tip your head in the side that you're trying to invite the vertebrae to bend, see if that makes it a little easier. And what if you go ridiculously far onto that other side sit bone? Go as far as you can onto that other side sit bone. See if that allows you to talk to some of the vertebrae that were a little harder to talk to. It's weird because we don't have any nerve endings right there in the vertebrae. It's, it's not like with our fingers where we can feel everything so well. So this is, it's, it's imagination and kind of sensing what, what happens. Okay, good. Rest for a moment. Rest and take a breath in and see which side the air goes in better. And then let's experiment on the other side. So you put all your weight into the opposite side that you want to shorten. And imagine that stick coming in at different angles. So it could go up a little to get neck vertebrae to participate, straight across in the middle, the lower ones, you, there's a downward push on the curve. It's like, like the bicycle wheel, the spokes aim at different parts of the curve. And try putting your weight as far over as you can and exploring how, which parts of your foot make this easiest. So pressing on the same side foot that you're curving, which parts of your foot make it easier to bend in different places? And then just stop at rest for a moment. We're going to alternate now. So you could start, say, with a vertebrae right in the middle of the neck and tip it one way and then tip it the other way. And if one side is hard, see if there's something you were doing on the other side in terms of how you shifted your weight how you moved your shoulders, that can help you find it on the other side. Shifting the weight is a really important part of this, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then pick another spot. And if, if it helps to put your fingers on the spot, you can. Or just imagining which vertebrae you're talking to. And there's, there's, it's like a funny feeling, you know, sometimes you have to lengthen one side of your neck, or you might feel a stretchy feeling under the other armpit, or it might be something you're doing with your feet. If you keep your feet out under the fourth, 
it becomes easier to talk to the, especially the lower vertebrae. And for anybody who has times when they feel, especially in the neck, one side working way harder than the other, this begins to help your brain find how to get equal support from the, the two sides. And many of us have some scoliosis patterns in our back where our back has these extra little curves in it. And this helps um, your brain learn how to even those out. But the, the physics of how, so go ahead and, and, and stop playing for a moment. The physics of how our head is balanced on our body is this arch that our pelvis makes. The sacrum is the keystone in the arch and then the spine comes right out of the middle. And so any difference in how our legs support us and how our legs support us going into our hip joints means that if, if this isn't even here, there's no way we can be even up on the top. And so the, the best way to focus on helping our heads feel better is by getting more even support up from the bottom. So we're gonna play now with imagining that there's a stick that goes from your right hip joint up to your right shoulder. And when you lift your right hip joint, go ahead and lift your right hip joint and see where that, see if you can aim the stick right at your shoulder. And we've, we've talked a little bit in other classes about how you get the weight, how you lift a hip. You could either push down with your foot you could use your sit bone on the chair and kind of scoop sideways with your other sit bone and it tilts your pelvis. So if, if this is your pelvis, by scooping this corner of it, it lifts the other corner. By pushing down on this corner, it lifts the other one. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, change the angle that the stick goes. So instead of pushing right into the shoulder, change it so it goes like halfway between your shoulder and your neck. Yes, you have a question? No, I really lost you. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting you back. Sorry. Just go ahead. Okay. So you're aiming your, your stick that's inside you now a little closer, like toward your ear, like you're lifting your hip to lift your opposite ear. And then shift the stick a little more so that you're trying to lift your head, like it somehow comes right to the base of your skull. And, and lifts you there. You might play with the idea that we talked about, oh, I think last week, of that there was a, a stripe. I put tape on, on, on my hands and, and on the foot that your foot is rotating outward a little. Like this line gets pulled back toward the outer heel. the arch lifts up a little bit to help the foot roll out and backwards. And that, that line helps you doing that in your leg so your feet stay on the ground, but your foot rolls out and back. And that helps you direct the stick. Okay. Rest for a moment. And which side of your body feels calmer right now?
When you breathe in, which sit bone can you talk to more clearly with your breath? So you can like breathe in to push on your sit bone and it makes you get taller. And then let's put the stick on the other hip joint and begin to aim the stick right at your shoulder. So you first you have to find a way to lift that hip, which is going to be pressing your foot into the floor or taking your sit bone and your other sit bone and pushing into the chair and, and curving it a little bit or pushing out with these ribs a little bit. But you somehow lift that hip and it goes right into the shoulder and then begin changing the angle that the force goes. And if you close your eyes, it's like you can visualize this line of force of where it's lifting you. Trying to feel the line of force going right up into your head coming all the way out through the crown of your head. You really have to shift your weight in order to get this. If your weight doesn't shift, then it's hard to find the up. Okay. And rest for a moment. Now once lift one hip, aiming, well, let's aim for the opposite shoulder. When you lift one hip, aim for the opposite shoulder, and then lift the other hip and aim for the opposite shoulder. So your weight, you'll kind of swing across yourself a little bit. And then begin aiming the two sticks closer and closer and closer until both aim right up into lengthening your head. So it, it's also possible, and I'm noticing this in a few people, that you're aiming your stick more toward your side. So your body is going kind of like this. See how my head is going left and right? That's, that's not what we're after in this particular motion. Sometimes we, we aim for that. But right now it's sort of a straight line from the hip right up to the top of the head is what you're, you're trying to find that that sense. So it means the hip has to actually lift up off the chair a little bit in order to lift your head. And then let that go and take both hips and raise up a little bit which is that sense of your feet pressing, your thighs rotating out a little so that your, the ball and socket goes into the hip joint and it just makes you taller. Okay, good. Let that go. And what did you do to let it go? To let the stick go? Did you roll back on your sit bone a little? And you got shorter, <laughs> yeah. And did you collapse a little in the ribs so that that line of force goes out the side, okay? So now find that place. It's usually a little bit forward on the sit bones where you can have a sense that the force goes up, 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 up into, into that length. Can you still breathe while you're up there? And then come back, fall back down, and see what your own particular pattern of falling is. And then fall up um, in, the, in, the, in the sense of, of up. And feel when you're up in that place where the two sticks come up into the neck, 
Try turning your head and feel what it feels like to move your head. Okay. And then fall back. You could exaggerate your falling back pattern, whatever it is, and turn your head and see if you get that kind of sticky tissue feeling of like, it, it just doesn't feel quite nice to, to turn. And then come back a little bit forward. Find both of your sit bones, both of your feet out on the outside edge, and that sense of a stick pushing from each sit bone up to your neck. And now get up and stand up for a moment. And we're gonna play a, a strange game, which is um, we're gonna make poses like playing statues and I don't know, maybe the last time you did it was in elementary school. Um, but just make some kind of pose and feel how when you make that pose, one hip lifts up and feel where does it push out the other side? So in, in any pose, lift a hip and feel, trying to imagine where this stick pushes out from, from, the, from the hip. And make your poses so that it goes in different places. So you might find yourself rolling up to the front of one foot. If you bend over and reach for something, you could feel how there's a stick from the hip that helps you reach forward into some crazy pose. It's like you're beginning to see yourself as this line of force that goes from your foot up to wherever you choose to put your hand. You could pick a particular color like a neon light. And when you feel this connection going up through your body, Turn it neon. So you're your own personal light show as you're, as you're moving. And then play for a little bit, trying to do different things with your body that make the force go right up into your head and give you that feeling of being tall. You could try taking a step forward and finding where do you feel from your foot up to your head tall. And I see some of you doing this in your chair and that's fine. It's the same, just kind of going in different angles, trying to sense that line of force that connects the hips to your upper body. Because that's where your power is going to come from. All right, and come back and sit down. and find that place of forward and tall as you're sitting. And close your eyes and just subtly check in with yourself. Have you collapsed a little bit on one side? Is one hip pressing a little harder into the chair than the other, one sit bone? And play with the base to try to even out where your head sits. And check in to see if you've got it by closing your eyes, imagining that plumb bob from your nose going down to the floor. Is it in a different position than it was before? Are your feet settling into a different pattern of supporting you in order to keep this plumb bob in the middle? And use your feet to pass the plumb bob left and right. So it's like the pendulum hanging from your nose and 
You can use your feet to move it left and right. You can move your feet to move it forward and backward. You could use your sit bones to move it left and right. Or your sit bones to move it forward and back. You could take that in a circle using your foot, your feet and your sit bones to move your nose. Use your feet and your sit bones to go the other way. And then find that middle place where it's like the guy wires that hold up your head are even on the two sides. And tip your head just slightly. How much do you have to tip your head in order to feel one side of your neck tighten up? So a lot of times we go around thinking, I've got a bad neck, I've got a sore neck. And it's, it's, it's your sit bones. It's the sit bones and how the force comes up through you so that this big weight can balance on this little point. You know, if you had a basketball and you were balancing it on your finger, I'll have a ball in this room. If it was off center, it would fall off. And our neck is just doing its job to keep our head from falling off. Um, so appreciate it for what it does do. It has kept your head from falling off for all these years. Um, but you've got to find ways from underneath to get the support coming up evenly to make it comfortable on both sides. All right, any comments or questions about today's class? Scott. I felt like when we were standing, I lost the feedback from the sit bones that you get when you're doing the same thing on the chair. And so it felt harder to uh, kind of engage them to get the, the sticks pointing in the right direction. Yeah, we didn't focus very much today on the connection from foot to hip. And I think we'll play with that again next Tuesday and then do some of the same thing again to help find it from the feet up. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth. I find that when I was trying to go up straighter, I'm doing a lot of work with the, my uh, thighs on the top to lift. And it's supposed to come from my bones, not those muscles. So lifting always requires some muscular effort. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a concept in Aikido that I like, which is that the weight from under if I think from lifting, to, to lift one hip, if I think about the lift coming from under my sit bone coming up, like there's a, a hydraulic lift under there, then the tops of the thighs don't work so hard. It's like, you, it, this is one of those things that Barbara was talking about at the beginning of where the movement starts. There are different ways to lift. And if you lift more by, um, thinking of your sit bone pushing down and carving into your chair, that also reduces the work in the front of the thigh. Because if you think about the muscle in the front of the thigh, it's meant for straightening your, your leg. It, 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 it's bringing your, your knee closer to your body. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're trying not to do that by lifting the hip that, that that um, muscle can actually lengthen while you're doing this. I, I'm okay doing it individually, one side at a time. I can lift up really well. But when I go to do together, I suddenly become um, re restricted with it. Okay. When you go to lift up together, make it a little smaller movement. 
Okay. Yeah. Because when you do it one-sided, it's easy to have this sort of big push up, but we're not going to grow by two inches in the middle. So do it just a little smaller so that you don't have to engage those muscles. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There's, there's, yeah. Okay, Barbara. When you visualize the two poles coming up through your skull or your bone, do they cross or do they, are they straight? Since the lines are coming from a wider base in your hips up here, they would eventually cross and like above your head, they'd be coming out. Okay, above the head. Yeah. Yeah. Irene, so I if, if, uh, uh, not? if if I, I notice a tendency to, to collapse on one feet, and uh, so actually in a more pragmatic way, how can you fix this asymmetry? Where do you start from? Um, the first thing is, is sensing it and realizing that it comes from lower in the body um, because that gives you a place to play. You, it's very hard to fix it just from up at the top. Um, and with the, with the foot, and this is something we've done in some lessons before you joined the group, and so we'll, we'll do it again, um, but when your leg um, has its support underneath the base of the fourth toe, and when mm -hmm. the arch rolls out a little, and the fibula moves back a little, and the thigh rotates out a little, it drives this ball right into the socket of your hip and gives you the support. And learning how to do that is a learnable skill, and we'll, we'll work on that. Um, but if you let your weight roll in to your big toes, um, it pulls this ball out of the socket and you don't get the support for the base of this arch that everything sits in. Um, yeah, I, I understand this. Uh, uh, I, I, my, my but question, how do you do it? <laughs> you know, when you notice that, uh, that, for example, because of the foot collapse, that one hip is a little bit higher than the other. So should you fix it uh, artificially, like try to, 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 to balance it, to put more pressure on the other leg, or uh, use the muscles to, to contract one, one side and lengthen another side? It's, it's always a puzzle, this, how to fix this asymmetry. So for me, if I try to fix it deliberately by going, okay, I'm going to um, tighten this side to balance the tightness in the other side or something, I end up just feeling like rigid and locked up. Right. But if I let myself experiment a little bit, it oh. just kind of naturally gets easier. And I find things like this thing we did today of the aiming the force on different vertebrae it just gives my brain more possibilities and then my brain chooses a better thing when I'm moving. Or if I play with the stick and I play going at different angles, kind of just exploring like that and trying to find some possibilities, then I find that when I get up and walk around, everything doesn't collapse as much. Um, so, I would go for the experimental model rather than, because our bodies are never static. We're always, right. no matter how we're standing, we've got to find the force from our foot up to our head. We're always looking for that, that sensation. And um, so getting used to looking for that sensation will help your brain just do the right thing. Do, do you believe that if the spine would be freer, so it will automatically, unconsciously organize the bilateral uh, asymmetry. It will eventually... Yes, but the spine can't be free if it gets uneven support from below it. Because if it gets uneven support from below it, the spine's primary purpose is to keep you from falling over. And it's not going to let you fall over because it's going to be tighter on one side so that you don't fall over. Um, and we all have, you know, different injuries and different things that make us asymmetric. 
And so this is an ongoing, uh, a, a lifelong sensation goal of looking for the support from the foot up into different ways. Um, and it, it doesn't, there's no like, you fix this and then it, it stays that way. Um, and so that's yeah. why, yeah, does that make sense? Very much, because when I try to fix my muscles, I feel that I am messing things even more. That yes. The, 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 yes. The, the system become, becomes more confused and, and, and le it's less effective. It's not effective, actually. Right. And then you get, like Al, Al was saying before, that you start walking and everything feels just weird and disconnected because you're, you're trying too hard or whatever. And you stop, take a breath, and then can find a way to to just have it, have it work. It's what I like about Felden, the Feldenkrais way of looking at things rather than the, um, like, let's fix one little piece because we are such a dynamic system and the movement part of our brain really can work out some complex challenges um, if we give it sort of the, the variety that it needs to, to find. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Just notice how you're feeling now at the end. Stand up, everybody. Walk, walk a little. And go find a wall that you want to push over. Or a piano to move, or or just something you can push against. And Push against it a little bit and feel that line of force go from where you're pushing down into your feet. You can do this if you're sitting in a chair, push against your desk and find the connection between your hand and your sit bones or your hand and your feet. And that's gonna be the homework over this weekend is look for the connection in whatever you're doing between your hand and your feet. And I will see you all next Tuesday. Thanks for hanging out a little extra along with us today as we wrapped up the lesson. All right, bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.